show. Um, and as we begin, again, there are no, um, this is the CME information that Rana always shares with the team and we have no financial disclosures to make um, regarding the contents of this uh, program. Um, so yeah, this is, as I mentioned, kind of we're just gonna talk about sort of the basics of opioid use disorder treatment as well as the barriers. And of course, we'll go into a lot more depth with it over the next, um, over the next three months or so as we do our three month cycle. Um, and as I present again, just uh, Rana sort of mentioned, mentioned this right at the beginning, uh, but just, uh, you know, just wanted to still put out that um, for Project ECHO, really the heart of the program are the case presentations, right? Because I think that's sort of the best way to apply knowledge and learn from each other, learn from all the multiple perspectives that our, um, our audience members bring. Uh, so I would, you know, strong consider bringing a case um, that may be challenging or that may be interesting or that you, um, you know, uh, may want to uh, share. So with that, let me kind of get going. We're going to sort of talk about some of the key findings of the kind of the national opioid overdose epidemic, the opioid epidemic as it has been defined uh, by the White House. Um, and we'll then go into sort of recommended treatment options. What's recommended and what's not recommended, right? And then I wanna end with sort of the ideas of um, and identifying some of the barriers in treating opioid use disorder in um, clinical practice. And OUD of course uh, stands for opioid use disorder. MAT here stands for medication assisted treatment. Also an increasingly called MOUD, right? Or medications for opioid use disorder is really the evolving term uh, with that. Um, so we'll begin with an epidemiology. I think the key point of this slide is that the opioid epidemic did not hit us overnight. It hit us in waves, right? If you think back to the 1990s, we start seeing this, uh, you know, really more generous prescribing of opioid pain medications, right? Uh, pain becomes the fifth vital sign in late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, drug companies are really promoting some of the longer acting um, opioid formulations that were new on the market as being safe in terms of overdose and in terms of um, addiction risk. Things that we now know are not true. And yet that happened and we saw these rising rates of um, opioid prescribing. And the first kind of alarming data really started coming out uh, in the early 2000s. Um, you know, I believe one of the earliest reports was uh, from SAMHSA in 2003 that showed that in the decade prior, emergency department visits related to oxycodone and hydrocodone had skyrocketed. I think the oxycodone related emergency department visits had gone up 450% and hydrocodone was just a little bit behind. So more education efforts started to take place, more um, legislative efforts started to take place and yet the rate doubled. Emergency department visits related to these substances doubled again between 2003 and 2009, right? And um, Around then is some of the legislation around opioid prescribing began to be passed. Um, you know, considerations about morphine milligram equivalents, more training for prescribers, et cetera. And I think part of the unintended consequence was that many providers abruptly stopped prescribing opioids to patients who had chronically been on them, who had been on these opioids for a long time. And unfortunately, as we should have anticipated, these, many of these patients went into withdrawal and to treat those withdrawals, they turned to whatever they could turn to. And unfortunately, that was heroin, which was available on the street. So just as we start, kind of the commonly prescribed opioids starting to taper off around 2010, that's when you can see that orange line, heroin, rising exponentially. And between 2009, 2010, and 2013, there was actually a six-fold increase in overdose mortalities related to heroin, there was the highest increase out of any substance that SAMHSA tracks and that happened. And that was really the second wave of the opioid epidemic. And then started the third wave, something that we're still in the middle of now. And those are what are technically called high potency synthetic opioids, commonly known as illicitly manufactured fentanyl and its analogs. And you can see how sharply that line has risen uh, starting right around 2013 or so. Um, and, um, you know, um, and these, uh, you know, these, um, and it's only seemed to be getting worse, right? Some of the data, um, provisional data, some of the newer data from CDC is showing that in the, during the COVID pandemic over the last 12 months, 
U.S. recorded the highest number of over drug overdose mortalities in recorded history. And there was, you know, 20 to 30 percent in increase, depending on which part of the country you look at, in overdose mortalities compared to the year previously. And really, it was these high potency synthetic opioids that seemed to largely drive that trend, right? Um, and if you look at all of these illicit mortalities, keep in mind that vast majority involve an opioid. And that's really what this slide is getting at. Um, there's this concept in infectious diseases literature called syndemic that some of you guys may have heard of. And syndemic is really this idea that um, two different pandemics collide, they come together and ultimately worsen outcomes for both. And I think it's fair to say that that's really what we're experiencing now, right? These pandemics, the COVID-19 pandemic, along with the opioid epidemic that hadn't gone away, have really come together. Uh, and we're seeing, uh, we're seeing sort of them impacting each other uh, with now some of the highest overdose mortalities recorded um, you know, um, happening um, during this past year. And if you look at New Mexico data, uh, certainly we've been not an exception to this, um, you know, uh, prescription opioids and heroin, in other words, opioids um, are the most common substances seen uh, in OMI reports, um, in terms of the Department of Health reports in terms of overdose mortalities, right? Methamphetamine you can see has risen sharply um, and, um, you know, and that's becoming increasing concern. We're seeing patients co-using methamphetamine and high potency synthetic opioids which of course presents another clinical challenge. So that's kind of where we are. And that's important because a lot of the data we have, a lot of the research we have, right, comes from before this third wave of the opioid epidemic in terms of dosing guidelines, in terms of prescribing practices. So how does this inform? And new research is starting to come out. A lot of new data is starting to come out. But when you're evaluating, especially an older study, for example, around how to start buprenorphine or the dosing of buprenorphine, I think we must really be mindful that how well does that apply to what we're seeing clinically now, what our patients are using now, and do we need to make any changes? Do we need to think about any changes, right? So that's one of the points I really wanted to make uh, with these slides. This is again, national data showing the green line, which is methamphetamine, really rising around the country um, in terms of um, you know, overdose mortalities. And the other big line that you see rising is that blue line at the bottom, which is fentanyl and analogs. In other words, our high potency synthetic opioids. So those have both really been increasing uh, dramatically in terms of overdose mortalities. Um, and this is just data showing uh, opioid overdose related emergency department visits in New Mexico um, up to 2018. And again, this trend has unfortunately started to reverse. Um, and opioid use disorders are associated with many, many adverse outcomes. We've talked about mortality. We've talked about emergency department visits, right? But other things that we must keep in mind is of course, medical risks, right? Of uh, things like HIV, in particular, hepatitis C, extremely common. And that's important because we should be screening. If we're starting to treat a patient with opioid use disorder, one of the, I think, pearls or important take home points is that we should be screening them for infectious diseases, including HIV and hepatitis C. And if they are in fact positive for hepatitis C, we should be talking about treatment options. We now have very effective and safe treatments available for hepatitis C, right? And it also is sort of a call to in integrate services and provide interdisciplinary treatment, which really does seem to improve outcomes. Mortality risk, there is a lot of data uh, kind of falls all over the place. And I've listed some of it. Some of older data really showed very dramatic increases in mortality uh, in patients with opioid use disorder, up to 63-fold. Some of the newer data, which I think may be more reasonable, has shown that compared to general population, someone with opioid use disorder not in treatment is somewhere between six to seven times more likely to die. And when you get those patients stable on maintenance medications for opioid use disorder, either with methadone or buprenorphine, that hazard ratio for mortality comes down to about 1.7. So there is a significant reduction in mortality with our FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder. Also things like low employment, crime, incarceration, cost to society, all of these really compound um, and, you know, and I think the good news is, is here is that we do have effective medications. 
as Dr. Amelie will go into in the starting in the next slide, uh, to really improve outcomes that have been shown to improve outcomes along all of these um, kind of parameters that I've listed, including mortality, right? So we have effective treatments, they're safe, they're effective, they work, they're cost effective. And yet the final point we'll come to is that they're not nearly as widely available as they should be. So what we can, can we do about it? So that will be the outline moving forward. Um, and I'm going to turn things over to you, Dr. Mealy, and I'm happy to advance the slides if you prefer. Okay, that, that's fine, if that's easier. Um, so I'm gonna try to quickly um, just give, give an overview of the, the psychosocial interventions um, and, and where we're going to start is talking kind of in general, because some of the biggest barriers um, is, is, as Dr. Bott said, is, is sort of a lack of availability or um, uh, training on, on some of these highly effective evidence-based um, interventions and, and the history that comes along with treating this population, which unfortunately carries a fair amount of bias and stigma, which can really impact um, how patients access care and how successful they are when they're in care. So um, if you could start the slides. Okay, um, so, so starting with that history in mind, it's important to, to kind of embed where we are currently uh, with thinking about how we treat substance use disorder um, in, in the overall how we've done this for, for the past hundreds of years. So um, this, this history is still very much with us um, in, even in, in recent, uh, life treating addiction as a crime and trying to remove uh, patients with this condition from their home, from their family, from their community. Um, and this has been going on uh, for quite some time. We seem to cycle about every 50 to 60 years or so, we cycle back to where there's um, a political emphasis on, um, on, on trying to criminalize either substance use, uh, distribution, or intoxication, right? Um, we've also had a long history of viewing addiction as a moral problem or failing and treating these patients as if they lack willpower or they have weak character um, and really seeing it as, as, as if they really wanted to, they would just stop. Um, we, we also have a history of treating addiction from a disease-based model, which does make a lot of sense. And we still utilize some of that language today, but unfortunately it, it, it isn't as complicated as, as the, the reality of addiction. So it's really seeing it as kind of this, this cause and effect. So if I have um, something wrong with, uh, with my, my pancreas, well, then I just, I need to, I need to augment that, that problem and it'll, it'll solve it. Well, we know addiction is, is really this last line. It's a complex multifaceted condi con condition. There is a disease element to it, obviously. Um, but, but there's also a, a fair amount of psychological, social, and environmental contributors that need to be attended to. And that's why the best combination is, is to look at the, the medications that would be recommended along with the psychosocial intervention and making sure that those things go hand in hand to, to get all of the complexities. Next slide. Um, so, so really thinking about a treatment plan for patients that are struggling with with opiate use disorder as including components or aspects of both what do they need for the biological component of the addiction, what do they need for the psychological component of the addiction, and how are we helping support them in terms of those feedback loops that have been developed in their social and environmental family settings. Next slide. Um, so, so recognizing that as addiction is developing, it's a combination of all of these things, the, the individual variables, their biology, their genes, the environment in which they've developed this pattern of behavior, the drug that they're actually using, how often they're using it, the route of administration, how available it is, and all of those things are going to shift how their brain is functioning and the behaviors that they're engaged in. So, so addiction isn't as simple as remove the drug, remove the person from their environment, we have to attend to all of these factors. Next. Um, another component that is really important with thinking about intervention is recognizing that substance use disorder, opiate use disorder is a chronic condition. So that means that we, we wanna get out of the, the old mindset of we treat these patients episodically, we treat them just when they're in sort of the acute um, phase of their condition. Um, that sort of 20, 28 day rehab model um, and really think about this as treating them for the, the, their life. 
life, right? So it doesn't mean that they have to be engaged to the level of care we're providing for their entire life, but they're probably going to need to be engaged in some level of intervention that is focused on improvement with health, wellness, and their quality of life. So if if those things can be affected significantly, the environment, their, their engagement with work, engagement with community, then they're much more likely to maintain their recovery goals for the long term and, and escape that sort of um, uh, relapse cycle that a lot of folks get into. So keeping in mind that this is a chronic condition like many other chronic conditions, and it's probably gonna need some level of maintenance care and follow-up um, for a very long period of time. Next slide. Um, and, and, and so, so to, to work on, on, on removing some of that stigma that substance use disorder is, is somehow unique is to think about it in alignment with other chronic conditions, which have a, a lifestyle or environmental component, right? So that's why we, we often use like type two diabetes, um, um, uh, high, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, asthma, those types of conditions, because there's a heavy genetic component, the person didn't is just bringing those genes to the table, which have gotten activated. Um, and there is an environment person uh, interaction that's contributing to sort of the, the onset and maintenance of the condition. We also know that their adherence to medication, their relapse rates, their engagement in treatment looks very similar. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, individuals with a substance use disorder actually do a little bit better than those with hypertension and asthma in terms of their relapse rates. Um, so, so to try to remove this is seeing them as different or other and really seeing them individuals with a chronic condition that requires um, kind of a, a, a whole person or a wellness focus with their treatment plan rather than they just need this one intervention um, can, can help to really see the, the reality of what these patients are are bringing to the table. So recognizing we have to think about long-term, we have to think about both the environment and the person and all of those things that, that are gonna um, be necessary to help them really achieve uh, long-term behavior change. Next slide. Um, and then the other thing which I think I mentioned earlier is the importance of stigma and the role that this plays. So substance use disorder is still our most stigmatized mental health condition. Um, even by separating uh, a lot of the places where we work, such as, such as ASAP um, or other community clinics where, where some of you may be working, there tends to be this artificial separation between mental health and substance use. And, and um, substance use disorders, opiate use disorder is in the DSM. It is a, a, a mental health condition. It is highly, highly comorbid with other mental health conditions. And so we really have to work against that stigma because it is still very, very present. Um, and and we, when we sample medical professionals, even in recent surveys, we'll still have people say that these, these patients deserve uh, less priority in healthcare, that essentially their condition is their fault. And we, would, we wouldn't necessarily have that viewpoint with some of those other chronic conditions like, like type two diabetes or asthma, right? So really working on as providers our own stigma um, and, and, and when we're working with those patients to recognize that they're bringing internalized stigma to the table because of society, their family. And so we have to be really open to conversations to provide education, to, pri to try to support them in understanding um, that what they're experiencing is, is, is understandable and treatable. Um, and, and, and that will help to turn back some of that internal stigma because when that really takes hold, they're much less likely to stay in treatment, to um, pursue the types of ancillary care that they need for their, um, their mental or physical conditions. They're less likely to advocate for themselves. They're less likely to be actively engaged in employment or seek stable housing and all of those variables that um, Dr. Bott was mentioning um, go kind of hand in hand with these conditions. And so we really have to work against that internal stigma if we want to support patients in being successful. Next slide. So treatment recommendations in general, treat the whole person, not just uh, their use behavior. Treat them long-term, not just episodic, right? So we wanna think about a continuum of care that patients can step up or down intensity depending on what they need. Um, really having that combination of both medication, um, behavioral intervention, social support, uh, chronic care management sort of at a minimum. And that we're not looking to cure this condition but really help them to improve their life and their functioning, sort of regardless of, of the use behavior, but what is the, the healthiest that they can be? Um, and then using evidence-based treatments to help them shift their behavior. So taking a behavioral approach 
approach um, rather than some of those older models, which is looking at the individuals as, as inherently weak or broken in some way. Um, next slide. So um, having a wellness perspective includes having a treatment plan that's gonna address their physical health needs, emotional health needs, what is sort of the stability and quality of family relationships, um, their, their living environment or what's called a recovery environment, um, making sure that we're talking with them and actively encouraging positive community participation, whether that's at work, volunteering, their church, anything that gets them connected in a meaningful way. Because when people have purpose and meaning to get out of bed in the morning, they're going to make healthier decisions as their default. And it's going to be uh, easier for them to work with the tools that we're going to provide them uh, in terms of managing urges and cravings, in terms of avoiding those external triggers. So all of the things that we're going to teach are going to be so much more successful when they've identified what is my value set, what's important to me, and that's why I'm going to make this choice instead of this choice. Next. Um, so in terms of specific psychosocial interventions, they can be, you can go to the next slide, don't apply. they can be broken into two, uh, two categories. We have abstinence model um, programs, and those have been around for quite some time. And, and those assume that abstinence is really the best and only uh, mode of intervention. So that's like the AA or 12-step models. Um, this was highly disseminated uh, across um, many residential and inpatient programs um, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it was called the Minnesota model where they broke out the first six steps and implemented those in a residential SUD program that also had mid-management and all of these other components. Um, uh, so that is one model of treatment. And for the people that it works for, it works very well. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everybody across the board. So it's nice to be able to also apply a harm reduction model um, and be able to utilize that for, for patients where harm reduction may be indicated. And that's really where, again, we're pulling away from the use we allow patients to continue to use while in treatment, as long as they're working towards those health goals, those recovery goals. And we're focusing a lot more of our attention on how can you reduce harm? So if you're using at this level, are you willing to cut back by you know, a, a, a little bit each day? Or to, if you're using four times a day, are you willing to try only using three times a day? Um, so, so really just trying to increase health and decrease risk as the priority rather than that abstinence being the priority. Um, next slide. So those are the two models. Um, and then the other big model that's important with developing a psychosocial intervention plan is recognizing that stage that patients are going to need different things at different stages of their care. So this lines up the, the uh, stages of change model from pre-contemplation to, to relapse. And it shows you what is recommended at each one of those stages. So early on in care, when people are highly acute, they're still actively using, we're gonna wanna apply more motivational uh, strategies. Once patients move toward preparation and action, that's where we're gonna to wanna to match them with a specific EBP um, that is gonna benefit their needs at that point in time. And then once they've established some level of change, we wanna help them maintain those new behaviors. And then we're gonna focus on relapse prevention strategies. So that's where we're gonna help them to avoid going into a relapse cycle. Next slide. And then just real briefly um, uh, mention, there's a number of treatments out there that have been used historically and that are still used in some settings. So I wanted to provide you a slide of what is not recommended to use alone. So detox alone, um, individual uh, psychodynamic, psychoanalytic, unstructured, supportive, um, both individual or group interventions are not recommended, particularly for people early on in treatment. And that's because they may not have the interpersonal skills or the life skills to be able to tolerate those interventions. It's not that those aren't helpful, but those are definitely not helpful for those first few stages of care. And that's where a lot of patients enter treatment. And so just being really mindful that that's not the first course uh, that you wanna use. Um, definitely nothing that's confrontational, nothing that's shame-based. And then using things like acupuncture, relaxation, those are nice additives, but you're not gonna use those as a standalone intervention. Next slide. What is recommended um, to be used is absolutely motivational interviewing and enhancement, both individual and group. There's all kinds of cognitive behavioral interventions, individual and group that fall under that harm reduction model that could be used at any point in the stages of change piece. Contingency management, which is a, an incentive-based program, which can be added on to treatment as usual. Community reinforcement, um, it has a lot of evidence that, that 
can be done both individual and group. And then again, 12 step or peer program, smart recovery particularly has good evidence to support it. And what we don't use enough of, and I can't encourage enough, is integrating a structured family or a couples therapy into the interventions that you're doing because so much of what we need to change has to do with the home environment or those social interactions. So utilizing um, as much um, education and integration with their family or their support networks um, is going to be really effective. Okay, back to you, Dr. Bob. Thank you. Um, let me advance the slides. And then quickly kind of going into, and again, this is something that we cover in a lot more detail, but the data is clear that if we're tre treating opioid use disorders, the mainstay, the, you know, the centerpiece of our treatment must be one of our FDA approved medications uh, for opioid use disorder, which include methadone, which is our full mu agonist has been around since the 1970s, naltrexone, both oral and injectable, which is our antagonist treatment, and the focus of this echo uh, for the most part, which is uh, buprenorphine, right? Uh, in all of its forms, which is a partial agonist. Uh, buprenorphine really has been around since 2000. Um, you know, the data, the drug addiction treatment, drug abuse treatment Act was passed by the Congress in 2000, paving the way for buprenorphine becoming FDA approved as a schedule three medication for opioid use disorders treatment in 2002. A number of things have happened. Initially, it was physicians alone. Then thankfully in 2016 with the CARA Act, uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants also became eligible to prescribe buprenorphine. Then in 2018, I believe with the Support Act, the prescribing was extended to include other nurse specialties like clinical nurse specialists, nurse anesthetists, all of the um, uh, nurse uh, midwives, all of this to improve access. But they found that still significant barriers to treatment remain. If you look at psychosocial treatments, many of them that Dr. Maley talked about, right? Um, that's a vastly underserved need, under unmet need, right? In general, there is a lack of mental health providers in the United States, estimated shortage of 55%, and an even greater lack of behavioral health providers with substance use disorder specialty training, right? Stigmatization that Dr. Maley uh, talked about plays a major role. I mean, I hear this all the time, right? I don't wanna work with those people. Uh, there may also be limited knowledge, limited understanding, and that combined with things like low compensation, high turnover, high burnout rates creates a major need and actually a big barrier to why people often don't receive treatment. Uh, and SAMHSA has actually made it a strategic plan in terms of increasing this work, workforce, peer support specialists, uh, therapists, um, and, and tracking. Methadone, of course, comes with its own set of barriers. You can only receive methadone from a federally licensed and regulated opioid treatment program. Patients have to go in, and those slots haven't really gone up in the last two decades around the country, uh, methadone maintenance slot. Even as the opioid epidemic has raged, the spots for methadone treatment that are available have remained relatively constant, right? Uh, if you think about New Mexico, there are large swaths of our state even where there is not a single opioid treatment program. So that creates a major barrier. In theory, office-based treatment with buprenorphine really should address that issue, right? And also preserve the sanctity of that continuity of care. And yet, although the trend is starting to shift after the passage of CARA, significant gaps remain, right? So just to point out, if you look at rural parts of the country, right? Um, although there was a major increase between 2016 and 2018, in 2018, there's still a vast majority of our rural counties in the United States don't have a single provider who is wavered to prescribe buprenorphine. I think we've actually done quite well with this in New Mexico, as you can see. But look at this entire, I guess, what is, is this the tornado belt here in the middle of the country? All those areas that are not shaded, not colored in are counties without a single provider who prescribes buprenorphine. So you can see there are major gaps. I think New Mexico has actually done fairly well and we're working hard to get all of the counties col you know, uh, colored and uh, shaded, um, but we have got a ways to go. And finally, towards that spirit of improving access, I will end with the new HHS order. This was just issued a couple of months ago, went into effect, I believe at the end of April which basically says that it allows now qualified practitioners to obtain their X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine even without completing the training. 
which is eight hours for MDs and DOs and 24 hours for everyone else. So what the new guidance says is that if you really want to start prescribing buprenorphine, but you just don't have the time or the desire to complete the training, even today, you can go to this website, right? Um, and, and the instructions are attached here and I'll send out the revised slides. Um, we'll make sure you get these two slides that I added at the last minute. But, um, but it really tells you, you can sign up, say, I want the X waiver and you will get the X waiver even without having completed the training. The caveat is that if you utilize this exception, you'll be limited to 30 patients. You will not be able to apply to go up to 100 or even 275 patients that would still require the training. That being said, we're still making these trainings widely available because I think it is essential, right? I think it's great that the barrier is removed, but I think there is something nice in, in getting that comfort level, getting that basic knowledge, the basic skill set, and, and that really allows you to feel confident in what you're doing and also ensure that all of our patients are getting the standard of care treatments. So I will end here, I will stop share and uh, turn it back over 